Chapter 19. You must obey this now for a law that he that he will not work shall not eat, except by sickness be he he be disabled, for the labors of thirty or forty honest and industrious men shall not be consumed to maintain an hundred and fifty idle loiterers. Captain Smith Captain John Smith quoted in William Simmons E. D. the proceedings. On September 10th, 1608, Captain John Smith takes the oath of office and becomes our new president. He officially decrees, He that will not work shall not eat, and he holds us to it. Gentlemen or not, any man who wants supper has to pitch in. But even with the decree, he is well liked. Unlike Presidents Wingfield and Radcliffe before him, Captain Smith divides the rations equally with us and works right alongside us, sharing the burdens too. And he says in the cabin, Stays in the cabin he has always shared with Reverend Hunt, John Layden, and others. There will be no mansion in the woods for President Smith. There are a few gentlemen left from the group who tried to run off on the discovery with our food, and I sometimes hear grumbling from them, but they are far outnumbered now by men, new settlers and old, who have great respect and trust for Captain Smith. So now I am the page of a ruler. It is the most important I have ever felt in my life. I wish... My mom could know, and I hope she does know, taking the peak down from heaven now and then. She would also be very surprised to see that a commoner is our president. I think he would make her happy to know that here in the new world, the gentlemen don't hold all the power. Captain Smith continues to write our story. He is also drawing maps of the rivers and the land he has found on his exploration trips. I am relieved to find out that not all of his writings were destroyed in the fire. Some of the pages had already been sent back to England with Captain Newport. One day on late September, Richard and I are in the field harvesting vegetables. We have grown them the way Namantak taught us, planting the corn and beans together in a mound so that bean plants can climb the corn stalks. Suddenly we hear shouts from the river front. Ship ashore! And a few moments later, she flies the British flag. Richard and I stop working and look at each other. Could it be Captain Newport so soon? Richard asks. I look at the baskets of beans and squash we've already gathered. I hope we've done enough work to earn our supper and that no one will mind if we go to greet the ship. Let's go see, I say. Our men come to the riverfront as well. We watch as the ship glides toward shore. Captain Newport is at her helm. Another crowd of colonists to feed, no doubt, Henry grumbles. Let's hope they sent us more skilled workers and fewer gentlemen, as I requested, says President Smith. The ship anchors. The long boat is lowered and the first few passengers begin, began to climb down the rope ladder. The late afternoon sun glints in my eyes, and at first I think that what I am seeing is a trick of the light, but then I hear the men around me as amazed as I am. Could it be? My lord, it's a vision. How could they send women to this godforsaken place? As the longboat nears us, men trip over one another, rushing to help. Let me give her a hand. No, let me give her a hand. I'm surprised we don't have a fist fight before the long boat even lands. In the boat are a number of men. But all any of us see are the two men's women sitting straight back, clutching satchels. One of the women is older and larger with a round face and a double chin. The other woman, a, a girl really, has pale skin and dark, bright eyes. A few black curls peek out from under her coif. I listen to the conversation as longboat passengers are introduced to President Smith, Master Francis West, Master Daniel Tucker, Master and Mrs. Thomas Forrest, and Mrs. Forrest's servant girl, Anne Burroughs. It has been a very long time since we have seen English women. It gives me a twinge of sadness of missing my mother to see their colorful petticoats, indigo blue and saffron yellow, and white coifs. It feels familiar like home. Miss Anne Burroughs squints her eyes, scowls, and ignores the men who are jostling one another to have a chance to carry her satchel. She holds tight to that satchel and turns her back to them. I feel sorry for her being the center of attention like that when she obviously doesn't want to be. Nam and Tack is on the next longboat trip to shore. I am surprised to see that he is wearing a linen shirt, but England did not change him too much. His hair is still shaved close on one side and long on the other, and his eyes are still bright. He beams at me. Hello, Samuel. How are you? He calls out in, in accent English. I am now a world traveler. I laugh. 
you are speaking English well, my friend, I called to him. I realize that in his months away with no one to speak Algonquin with, he has been he has had plenty of time to learn the English language, much more than the few words and phrases Ruth and Hun taught him before he left. Namantak, where is your stick? I ask. Did you make lots of notches in it? Namantak shakes his head. Too many people, he says. I throw stick and ripper. Reverend Hunt is very happy that Namantak is now speaking English so well. He wastes no time, but sits him down to tell him about God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and now he must bring the message of salvation to other Pohatans. Namantak nods enthusiastically. Yes, yes, I learn of your gods in England, and I tell them of your gods. He la laughs, my gods. He launches into a lively description of Ochias, the vengeful god who requires sacrifices of tobacco, copper, beads, and sometimes animal blood and sends punishment if he is not made happy. He tells us about uh, Ahon, the god who is all-loving, all-forgiving, who makes the sun shine and ripens the crops, and he tells us of the great respect his people have for the spirit of life that is in all things, people, animals, plants, fire, water, wind. Reverend Hunt shakes his head. There is only one god, maker of heaven and earth, Reverend Hunt tells us. The story of creation, how God made the world and all things in it in six days and rest, rested on the seventh day, the Sabbath. Again, Namantek nods with interest. Now I tell you how our world has made was made, he says. He tells us a story about the great hare who created different kinds of men and women and put them in a big sack. He protected them from giants who wanted to eat them. The great hare filled the rivers with fish and put deer upon land. Then he took the men and women out of the sack and put them in different places on the earth to live. I enjoy Namantak's story, but I can see that Reverend Hunt is becoming discouraged. Namantak does not understand that he is to give up his gods and his stories and take the word of God from the Bible back to his people. Reverend Hunt begins to explain again, but Captain Smith finds us boys sitting idle and tells Reverend Hunt he needs us to come work in the gardens. I put on my straw hat and pick up a basket. I hope Reverend Hunt is not too disappointed that his first time trying to convert a Virginia native to Christiana did not work out. Captain Newport has brought us 70 new colonists, stores, and the news that the rocks we sent to England were once again just rocks. The Virginia Company has a new idea about how we can make a profit. We are to use the raw materials we have here in Virginia and begin making glass, pitch, tar, and soap ashes to send back to England. They sent us several Pol Polish and German tradesmen to get us started with these projects. They have already begun to build a glass house a little way from our fort with a large furnace for glass making. Captain Newport has also brought orders from the Virginia company to place an English crown on Chief Powhatan's head making him a prince under King James and making all of his people English subjects. My mind reels when I hear this. Chief Powhatan thinks we are his subjects, and now they want to make Powhatan's people English subjects? The whole thing tangles my brain in knots. If the thought of being Chief Powhatan's subjects would be distasteful to the gentleman, then I imagine that becoming subjects of King James would be just as distasteful to the Powhatan people, especially after they hear Namantak's text report on King James, who he met while he was in London. Or Chief Powhatan has is much better than your king, Namantak says, speaking in Algonquian, so that the gentleman will not hear his assessment of our exalted king. Your king is a short, weak man. Our chief is tall and very strong. Your king has no hair and no teeth, just a round belly for, from eating too much. How can such a man be king? A look of disgust crosses Namantak's text, face as if he is not quite sure how to tell me his next point and he stinks does he not bathe and he drinks wine until he can no longer speak or stand i have heard these stories about our king james it is well known that the king's doctors have warned him that bathing causes the plague and he has taken this advice to heart he almost never bathes yet englishmen still honor him he is after all our king namantak feels no such obligation. The natives bathe quite often, even in cold weather. They have no fear of the English plague, only disdain for English stink. Our chief Bohan is a true king, says Namantak. He is powerful and honorable. I am about to have my first chance to meet the great chief Bohan. Chief Smith is taking me and Namantak 
along with three other men overland to where it will come McCall. We will be bringing an invitation to Chief Bohutton to come to Jamestown to receive guests from King James and to be crowned. Captain Smith is angry at the whole plan. Very angry. Make an emperor into a prince? Ask an emperor to travel to receive gifts? I assure you, this will not sit well with Chief Bohutton, he says. He is king here in his own country. What right does King James have from across an ocean to make him his subject? Power is like weights in a balance. No one gains power without someone else losing power. And Chief Bohutton does not want to lose any of his power. It has been a long, hard road to peace with Chief Bohan, but if he understands what this coronation means, it may well be the end of our peace. Captain Newport refuses to budge. He is bound to carry out the orders from the Virginia Company, and so Captain Smith repairs for our journey to Werowakamako. In the meantime, Miss Anne Burroughs is making quite an impression at Jamestown. She is almost always busy taking care of Mrs. Forrest, a very plump gentlewoman who hasn't figured out yet that life in Jamestown will be a lot harder than life in England. She's constantly making demands on Anne. Heat some water, wash these clothes, get supper on the table. Mrs. Forrest insists on having her meals in her cabin with her husband instead of eating from the communal cook pot with the rest of us. During the rare moments, Anne is not busy. She has every unmarried man in the colony trying to get her attention. Even Nathaniel, who is 16 by now, makes a fool of himself, strutting around in his armor, making a show of his musket and sword. There are at least two of or three fist fights a day, and I have no doubt they are because of Miss Anne Burroughs. She is 14 years old, so she is of marriageable age, and I suspect we will have a wedding before too long. One day, Richard Nam Namantak and I are sent to repair the fish nets and bring back the catch for supper. We are the only ones at the river front when Anne comes down to fill buckets with water. Here, we can fill them, Richard office offers. We're already barefoot and wet. He takes the buckets from her. Anne doesn't smile or say thank you. She just looks away. It is as if she has become afraid to look anyone in the eye for fear they will try to court her. We're just boys, I want to say. We'll be your friends. While we fill the buckets, Anne walks to where some wildflowers are growing and picks a small bouquet of yellow, purple, and white. Then it seems as if my unspoken message has somehow gotten through because she comes and sits down near us. A moment of peace, she says, and rubs her sore shoulders. Your mistress works you hard, I say. I do not add what I have been thinking for weeks. You'll never live through the winter if you stay so skinny and tired. But I don't ask what I have been suspicious about. Is your mistress eating some of your food rations? And shrugs. No harder than I worked in England, he, she says. But I know this cannot be true. President Smith says if we don't work, we don't get to eat, says Richard. I don't see your mistress doing much work. But by the looks of her, she does a whole lot of eating. Richard Namatak and I laugh. But Anne scowls. Don't insult my mistress, she scowl, scolds. But we can't help ourselves and soon she breaks down and laughs with us when we settle Anne says mistress Fortre forest makes me work every moment because she is afraid i'll find a bow she blushes as she says it her husband says i should marry but she wants to keep me as her maid you have found this bow view namantak asks and shakes her head she found about a hundred of them, Richard exclaims, and this starts us all laughing again. Finally, Anne sighs. I better get back or I'll get a beating for do dawdling, she says. We help her balance the yoke across her shoulders and lift the buckets of water, and I watch her walk back to the fort. I think that Mrs. Forrest should be made to do her own chores, and that Anne's best chance of making it through the winter will be to get away from that demanding woman. When she is gone, Richard asks, what do you think she'll marry? Who do you think she will marry if she gets permission? Maybe your werewins, Captain Smith, Namantek suggests. I shake my head. He's the only unmarried man not courting her. He must be too busy for marriage. As we repair the fishnets, we have fun guessing who Miss Ann Burris will pick if she gets permission to wed. I only hope she finds someone who will be kind to her and make sure she gets her full food rations. I have never dug a grave for a girl before, and I don't want to start now.